Let me welcome uh, Phil Goldberg, who is the author of the recently released Life of Yogananda. We're going to speak about his book, about his journey, uh, researching the book, and a little bit about the significance of the figure of Yogananda and a book like the one that uh, Phil just wrote. Phil, as he says, uh, when he describes himself, he's been searching for our higher truths relentlessly since uh, his youth, which brought him through a variety of circuitous academic pursuits to the work of Alan Watts, Aldous Huxley, and the study of Buddhism, Taoism, Hinduism, particularly with a focus on Vedanta and yoga. He certainly has the depth of background to write a book like this. Phil spent the 70s uh, teaching meditation for the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's Transcendental Meditation work throughout the world. And since that time, he's continued to be a leading voice in the interspiritual world, the spiritual world, his publishing has illuminated the path and also the pitfalls on the path for new seekers so they can benefit from the depth of Phil's experience and study. I met Phil when he was working on his book that was published in 2010, American Veda. We spent uh, some time in deep discussion about the whole movement of Western teachers working from Eastern paths. And since then, I've been a friend and fan and an admirer. So I was thrilled when Phil said he would be happy to talk with me so I could bring you the depths of his knowledge and particularly uh, his work on the life of Yogananda. I got this book, I got a pre-release copy and I didn't put it down. I read it in virtually one sitting, which I never do these days, given how interrupted I am. And the fact that it, my work right now is working with mindfulness in the school system, so very far from Eastern teachers and Eastern philosophy. And I absolutely love the book. So thank you, Phil. You've done a service for seekers, and I'm excited to talk with you about it. Thank you, Amy. Very kind of you indeed. I'm delighted. Yeah. Good to be with you. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you too. So what compelled you to write the book? Well, I read, uh, I read Yogananda's autobiography of a yogi like millions of other people in the early phases of my own uh, spiritual life. That was 1970, actually. So the story I tell is that um, uh, he had a big influence on me, but I never became a devotee of his or a formal student, but he was just one of the many teachers I learned from. And, um, and that book was instrumental uh, in sort of advancing me in certain ways. Uh, and I still have that copy back here somewhere. I can't reach it. <laughs> um, and um, and I, I joke that it's uh, the the book says it costs five dollars on it, and I would not have had five dollars in 1970 to spend on a hardcover. So I, I say that I wrote this book to make up for the karma of uh, ripping off someone's book and not not returning it. Uh, <laughs> but the 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 rest of the story is um, uh, Yogananda is one of those teachers who has a sort of presence in many of uh, our lives, whether we're devotees or not. And when I wrote American Veda, um, I came to more fully appreciate his importance in the sort of continuing unfolding story of Eastern wisdom coming to the West. And uh, he, he's, he was a giant figure in that regard. And I got fascinated by the human story of Yogananda while I was researching him for uh, 
what ended up just one chapter in American Veda. And so after that book was published, I had, you know, uh, among many other thoughts of what I should do next was maybe uh, a full-scale biography of Yogananda. And then I had to dig in and say, well, has anybody ever done that? And the answer was no. There were tribute sort of books by devotees who, you know, direct disciples uh, years ago, but no one had ever actually done a real biography. And uh, then I had to think, well, what, is there anything to be said that's not in his own autobiography? And that's, so I dug in there and it turned out that he leaves out a tremendous amount in, uh, in his own memoir years of, of his uh, important years of his life are just sort of summarized in, in a sentence or two. And uh, less than 10% of the book is about his life after he comes to America, which is where he spent 32 of his 59 years and where he did his work and where he established his wor uh, legacy and became famous. And so I thought, boy, there's a lot left to be said. And I thought there are lessons to be learned from digging into uh, the details of a life such as his. So that was the origin. That, that's what got me started. When you, there's so many questions I have. When you came to the end of we all have to finish our book sometimes. So when you came to the end and had to put it to bed, were there still mysteries and questions that you felt? Oh, yeah. There, sure. Um, there are things we'll never know. You know, like you know, there are things about any life we'll never know unless uh, something surfaces like a, a diary or un previously unseen letters. Uh, or witnesses to events that uh, somehow, you know, their, their accounts were buried, especially uh, with somebody who passed away in 1952. So uh, a lot of time has passed. There are many unanswered questions. Um, and, you know, certain mysteries will always remain, but I have no, I did everything I could to access what I, uh, what was available. And I had access to some really, you know, unprecedented stuff. And I, I found information that even, you know, his closest devotees tell me they uh, didn't know before. So I'm happy about that. But there's always un unfinished questions, even. But the worst part is there's always things you wish you could rewrite. <laughs> and that's a, that's a sort of writer's disease that you have to live with. Absolutely. <laughs> what, how long did it take you to research? And did you go to and from India as part of that? Or were you able yeah. to stay in the States? It was mostly in the States because that's mainly where he did his work. But I did go to India and visited uh, places where he lived and uh, the ashrams and um, uh, centers, some of the ashrams and centers that have been established in his name. The school he started before he left India and uh, still running. Uh, his home in Calcutta, some of the uh, ashrams where he, as a seeker, uh, found wisdom and from certain gurus in, and that sort of thing. Talked to family members. But um, most of the work was done in the U.S. where he did most of his work. And most of, and these days, a lot of it was done, you know, online. On, uh, I had access to paper files, boxes and boxes of them. But also a lot of it was, you know, you can do online now. And uh, because of social media, I was somehow found myself in contact with people um, who were kind of uh, collectors of all things Yogananda. And they were nice enough to share with me. Um, so, but most of it was done here in the uh, mess of my office. <laughs> Yeah. 
I love the way that you pulled out all of the incredible influences on his life and the people that he met. The fact that the famous Sri Aurobindo ghost was his relative. The fact that where he lived in Calcutta was this tiny little lodestone of awakened consciousness. And it reminded me a little Mm -hmm. bit of the transcendentalists in Concord, where among 12 households, there was this incredible genius and vision. And it felt like Yogananda, it's not surprising that he became who he was, given where his early life was spent. Do you want to share some of that? Yeah, I think one of the things, if I can uh, say what I brought to uh, the, the, the book that is not in other accounts of his early life in India, um, it's putting it in a historical and cultural context uh, that he couldn't do himself you know, without the distance of time and that other people haven't quite done. Uh, well, with some exceptions of, of scholars, but um, it, the whole the whole uh, process of sort of trying to come to grips with how uh, uh, this child born Mukundo Lal Ghosh in uh, northern India and with Bengali parents um, became Yogananda and this world teacher. Um, It was an exercise in sort of trying to sort out nature and nurture, which, you know, something you you can't really fully completely do, but you see certain certain traits that he had were sort of uncannily uh, uniquely his, you know, he was born that way, so to speak. Other influences you can attribute to family and environment uh, clearly. And, and one of those is, you know, his family moved around a bit. And then uh, in, when he was 13, they moved to Calcutta where they remained. And uh, his uh, brother's grandson and his wife live in the, in the house where Yogananda spent his teenage years and part of his early 20s. And um, part of the house remains a, a kind of shrine to Yogananda, and, and they allow certain people to come and visit. I take tour groups to it. Uh, and I forgot to turn the phone off, sorry. Uh, and, and, you know, so you can retrace some of his footsteps in, in Calcutta and other places. And, I, I, I take tours, uh, tour groups to do that. Um, but Calcutta at the, in those years um, was a fascinating place. It was the sort of, uh, before the uh, capital moved to Delhi, it was the capital of the British Empire in India. And it was the center of commerce and trade and industry. But it, it was also this, the neighborhood he lived in, I compared to Greenwich Village in that same time uh, period of history. It was a sort of hotbed of progressive thought. Uh, a lot, there are universities around there, <laughs> tree-lined streets, uh, a lot of uh, advanced thinking in, uh, in sciences and humanities took place there. Um, the the sort of spiritual revolution or religious revolution that came to be known as the uh, Bengal Renaissance or the Hindu Renaissance was centered there. The early days of the Indian independence movement, the the biggest, um, you know, uh, the sort of leaders of the uh, freedom movement at that time, many of them were centered there, certainly the most militant. That's where Sri Aurobindo was arrested and jailed uh, during those years uh, for sedition. And uh, where there was a lot of spiritual uh, ferment as well. And so some of the places Yogananda went uh, 
to in, in his teen years to uh, sort of meet with gurus and swamis and um, you can sort of retrace his footsteps now and and there was a lot going on and he was one of those kids I I shouldn't say that because not many kids are like that but he was he was he would go see any guru or swami that you know he could uh, maybe learn something from even when he was you know 12 13 14 years old and he wrote about a lot of that stuff and his uh, brother who wrote a memoir wrote about it uh, as did uh, some of his uh, companions and so that environment that intellectual spiritual political cultural uh ferment had a, a big influence on him and in particular the influence of uh, sri ramakrishna and swami vivekananda was very alive you can walk from the home where Vivekananda grew up, which is now a national museum, to the home where Yogananda spent his teenage years. And, you know, they were uh, born 30 years apart. And Vivekananda had already come to America and become a national hero, and Yogananda was a teenager. So um, he was influenced by all of that. Right. What I appreciated was the way that you respected his passion and his journey, but you made him very accessible. So I felt like I identified with the teenage Yogananda because when yeah. I was a teenager in the mid seventies and I was looking for every book that I could find and um, growing up in Pittsburgh was not a hotbed of spiritual philosophical thinking in the mid seventies, but that but it was a football. It was a football. <laughs> Absolutely. It was a spirit, just spirit of a different kind. Right. But that love of the seeking and, and wanting to meet people face to face that I felt came through your book was was something that I really shared with Yogananda. And I found it very inspiring to feel that youngster pushing the edge, founding his own ashrams, teaching right. meditation to his friends. Who right. knew? But he was... At 15. Was, of exactly. All. Yeah. And, and, and it being rebellious in, yes. in the best yes. kind of way and, and defying convention, defying order, not not for the sake of defiance, but because he was a teenager and he had passion and he was propelled to find out and meditate all night and push the edges and rope his friends into it and not take no or for an answer in terms of what was allowed or possible or permitted at his age. Yeah. And, and that kind of spirit, I feel, is one that is is necessary on the spiritual path if we're going to get anywhere significant. It's true, especially if your path is um, unconventional and does not comport with your family or your neighborhood or your, you know, the tradition you're from as, well, in, in, in Yogananda's case, it, it was not a radical departure from the spiritual tradition of his family. Uh, his, his parents were very deeply spiritual people and were disciples of Lahiri Mahasya, who was the guru of Yogananda's guru, the guru he ultimately uh, took on. But um, they nevertheless were not prepared for um, a son who <laughs> was not particularly interested in school and uh, the usual pursuits, and who had no intention of getting married. They, they arranged three marriages for him over the course of time, and he said no every time. He was offered plum jobs, you know, by his well-connected father. Uh, you know, he just, he knew early on. He had, he was one of those kids who was blessed with a, a vision of what they would be, at an early age, uh, and that turned out to be accurate. It's not like, you know, I'm going to be a baseball player, and, you know, but, you, but you're not talented. It, it wasn't like that. It was like he knew he was earmarked 
for spiritual leadership and spiritual attainment from a, an incredibly early age. He, he ran away from home three times or four um, in his adolescence, not to <laughs> join the circus, but to go to the Himalayas where he felt he was destined to meet his guru and he wanted to you know, be a renunciate like the, the yogis he had read about and heard about. And he, the first time he did that, he was 11. You know, that's pretty extraordinary. Uh, I always think of when I, when I was recounting his adolescence, it, it sort of reminded me of uh, some of the people we, we all know when we we're kids, when we we're, you know, sort of in those post-pubescent years, there were natural leaders, um, sort of ringleaders, and, but, you know, they usually are organizing parties or teams of sports teams or, you know, mischief of some kind. He was organizing satsangs. You know, he was gathering people to meditate together or to go see a guru or to go uh, do uh, some uh, ritual at a festival, at a temple. Um, and he was uh, meeting every guru he could find and, and sort of building a repertoire of spiritual practices that he would then teach his, his companions. He started an ashram had a little hut that they call it turned into an ashram at age 15. That hut, by the way, is now, you know, a center in Yogananda's lineage. It's, you know, it's a bigger, bigger building now uh, in Calcutta. So he was earmarked for that and had that reputation very early on. But as you said, that requires a certain independent spirit, uh, even though it's in the context of the sort of Hindu uh, ideal, uh, you don't expect that of a kid who um, you'd rather see, you know, doing his homework and, uh, you know, doing family uh, duties and so forth. So it required a certain rebelliousness. And uh, he, he was always that way, you know, he, even as uh, when he became a guru and he became a spiritual leader, he was uh, innovative and creative. He had a blend, as all the great teachers do, I discovered, of being innovative with certain aspects of the teachings and traditional and steadfast in maintaining the integrity of tradition at the same time. He became that kind of teacher, and he was kind of that way even as a kid. Mm. His innovation when he came to the States was also striking because I think from reading your book, I felt like Yogananda is actually the first who really was able to advertise and yes, use that's correct. marketing to appeal to the emotions, the desires, the weaknesses, the vanities of a, a population that was not familiar with what he was doing. And he was gathering audiences of 2000 at a time, yeah, it, it was which was unheard of. And when I read, you know, when you described some of the advertisements, I thought, oh, this is some of prob <laughs> probably some of the you know, marketing that we probably respect less these days. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a mixed thing, uh, mixed reaction when you see it. Um, now, uh, you're probably right in, the, in, the, in saying he was the first. I mean, he was preceded by Swami Vivekananda and Swamis in the Vivekananda lineage. There were other yoga masters. They probably advertised as well. I, you know, I don't know. But what the kind of not thing, to the extent that he did. No, no, certainly not. And he had to be persuaded early on. You know, those first four years in Boston, which he writes off in one sentence in Autobiography of a Yogi, uh, those were eventful years. He was getting, you know, he was getting acclimated to this new life and this new world here, um, down the road from Emerson and Thoreau and, and those guys, and. Um, you know, he had uh, a learning curve. And one of the things he had to be persuaded to do was to advertise uh, 
his uh, public events. You know, he started out, you know, lecturing in people's living rooms to whoever they could gather or, you know, a church or something where he might be invited to speak. And within a few years was filling large concert halls. His first lecture in America was called The Science of Religion. And he, you know, he, he spoke about yoga as a science of inner unfoldment. And he spoke about chakras and energy and, you know, bringing a scientific whatever scientific perspective he could from in 1920 to traditional yogic teachings, just like all the primary gurus have always done. Uh, but then he learned that to get people in the door, uh, you have to appeal to what is of interest to them, what, they, what their needs are. And he learned very early on that Americans are very pragmatic and very oriented towards self-improvement and getting ahead and you know all those kinds of things that are still uh, hallmarks of American culture and that a lot of other gurus learned along the way uh, to adapt to. And so instead of just talking about realization and spiritual awakening and higher consciousness, he uh, said, well, these yogic methods, you know, will help you in your work and you can have better health and you could have a better marriage and all those, you know, things that even in the 1920s were part of the self-help world. And the power of mind in, uh, uh, in those pursuits was part of the New Thought movement and other uh, kind of conventions that were developing at that time. And he learned. Uh, and that's part of the adaptation, you know, because the, it, it's not a lie. These yogic methods can, in fact, have those practical uh, results. But he, you know, it, it was not that he sold out and um, uh, kind of demeaned the traditional yoga, uh, Kriya yoga that he was bringing from his lineage. He was just saying that you could, uh, you know, if you're looking for that, <laughs> you can, these methods will help you, but there's also more to it. And, and that, that's the kind of adaptation of delivery and language uh, that you can think of either as a sellout or as skillful means, depending on your perspective. Well, he wouldn't have had the influence that he did, and he Precisely. wouldn't have touched that many millions if he hadn't done that. I don't have a problem with it. I was just, um, I was interested to see how deliberate it was, both on yeah. his part and on the part of a couple of people who helped him set up his talks and their advanced forays and his, That's right. his friendship with them and you know, what it takes to communicate these ideas and to to get some mind space from people who are absorbed in other things so that's right that's it right. is skillful means and it's necessary the fact that he did it at such an early time yeah i found another aspect of his revolutionary character and and also his mission he was he was not bound by how things were done he was bound by the call to communicate a higher possibility, a deeper Quite right. happiness. To Quite work. right. And he, he, he made those trade-offs consciously. You know, he, he had demonstrations of mind powers, you know, on stage. There was a bit of showbiz in him. <clears throat> and uh, that didn't go over well with tr traditionalists. He, you know, early on, put a lot, some of his teachings into a correspondence course. Now, that doesn't sound that uh, strange to us now, but in the 1920s, the idea of clipping a coupon in a publication and putting it in the mail with a check and then getting something in return was a fairly new technology. Mm -hmm. Sears Roebuck catalog was revolutionary, you know, for 
creating the mail order system that allowed people all over the country to buy goods that only, you know, sort of people in New York and Boston had access to in stores. And so he adapted that technology to his spiritual teachings and would have people <clears throat> receive weekly or biweekly lessons that um, had a certain sequence to them. And some of the methods that were traditionally taught one-on-one, -on -one, uh, he put in writing. And that was a big deal at that time. Now, you know, the equivalent might be an app or something. But traditional teachings in India are guru to student. And he had thousands of followers all spread out over, you know, the continent. So he, how can you reach them? Well, let's try mail order. How can I, I can't lecture, I can lecture to an auditorium full of people, but I can also go on radio and reach many more people. So he was open to the new technologies and new methods, but what he taught, the essential nature of what he taught was deeply traditional at the same time. Do you Try feel that he, too. yeah, do you feel that he deepened, he clearly deepened in his teaching ability, his efficacy, his ability to reach more people. And of course, he had many challenges over the time. He, you yes, know, he did. He had, there was a lot of dissent at various points. Do you feel he also deepened spiritually? Because one of the things that people think is that these great teachers, they have their period of seeking, they have their period of awakening, which somehow also feels like some latent realization that comes to the forefront. Yeah. And then they're fully flowered and then they grow as people, but their, their realization somehow seems more static. I'm wondering what your impression is. Even, even more, there are some people who feel uh, Yogananda, and I'm, I'm sure you know, their own guru, whoever that might be, was uh, an avatar born realized, born what we think of as enlightened, um, and was here like a bodhisattva only to serve us. But the evidence is otherwise. Uh, in, in Yogananda's case, and one of the things that I really appreciated about him um, was in his letters and some of the things he would say to disciples, which they then recorded, um, were very deeply personal. They were about his own spiritual breakthroughs. And I had access to, well, a lot of his letters have been published but I had access to some unpublished ones as well. And I was deeply moved um, to see essentially what we would think of as spiritual progress being recorded in his own words, uh, spiritual breakthroughs that he had in his forties, maybe even early 50, well, he died at 52, but in those at last 10, 15 years of his life, Letters from India, for example, he, he came here in 1920 at age 27 and uh, lived in America all the rest of his life with the exception of 16 months where he spent four months in Europe and a year in India. And some of his letters from India back to his close disciples in, in the US recorded spiritual experiences that if you're a student of these things, you recognize as um, consistent with the descriptions of certain states, stages of conscious and uh, of consciousness development as, as we know them uh, to the best we can. And um, those occurred in his 40s and, and uh, late 40s. And there were times when he would go into these deep states of what we would think of as samadhi for long periods of time. And after some of them, he'd say, well, you know, I, I will always be this way inside now and you won't know the difference in my outer appearance. I mean, these are indications and some of the uh, descriptions of what he was experiencing uh, 
not just like in meditation or in, in an internal sense, but how he was, uh, the, his perceptions of the world, of phenomenal experience, you see changes in that as well, um, leading to, you know, sort of, you could see breakthroughs in what people might think of as God consciousness or um, unitive states of consciousness. And, and from his descriptions, you, you would assume that um, he didn't have those stages states before, or maybe had glimpses of them, but they were, they were less vivid or less um, permanent. Um, so yes, he developed in, in his uh, spiritual life. And uh, as a human being on the planet, as a, a, a personality, you could see maturation as well. That was, to me, one of the great takeaways from the book, and very, uh, in that sense, uh, instructive for all of us. Did it inspire you to apply yourself or notice more in your own life and spiritual passion? Well, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, I do find myself um, occasionally uh, saying, oh, uh, Phil, remember what you learned about Yogananda. And, uh, for example, in addition to what we were just talking about, um, one of the things I think uh, is a useful takeaway. Um, many of us get on a spiritual path and we think, well, we just stick to our practices, we evolve and life will get easy and it'll be pleasant all the time and it'll only be love and sweetness and we mistake the possibility of inner states of uh, peace and bliss and contentment with outer conditions being conforming <laughs> to what we, we would uh, like to see. Um, Yogananda is a good case study in the fact that that's not necessarily the case. His life was not easy in that sense. He had a lot of joy and a lot of love and a lot of uh, just sort of human happiness. He was uh, capable of uh, fun and uh, play and enjoyment on the, in the human experience that we, we all share. But he also had hardships and he had challenges, and he had real difficulties. He had opposition. He had people trying to bring him down. He faced racism and religious bigotry that was far worse in the 1920s than it is even now. And there weren't many dark-skinned men with long hair wearing orange in those days, you know, and so, you know, he, he faced a lot. He had lawsuits that were played out on the front pages of newspapers with all kinds of salacious headlines and so forth. He had uh, people turn on him. He had to deal with money issues his whole life. Uh, his whole working life, he, you know, he was not just a spiritual teacher, but he became a very popular one, and that meant having a lot of followers and an organization and properties and uh, magazines and publications and people on salary, you know, who had to be paid and devotees running an organization who were not necessarily trained for such skill with such skills. And um, so he had, you know, tremendous challenges and he had to rise to the occasion. And don't, we should not forget that, you know, his money issues were always a problem, always something he worried about. And especially during the depression. I mean, he, he was teaching during the crash and during the, the 1930s when even the, the most skillful you know, business leaders were going bankrupt and he had to keep his organization afloat. Um, so he had to deal with stuff. And there were times when he 
when he say, stated uh, um, explicitly uh, that he didn't want to deal with this anymore. He'd rather go to India and be a monk, which is what he set out to do. Well, he was always a monk, but to live the sort of traditional renunciate's life. There are some tender moments when he's writing from India and he's, he writes about um, getting together and meeting with sadhus, uh, you know, at a festival on the Ganges and saying he just wishes he could be like with them again and join them and not have to deal with all this worldly stuff. But he had a mission and he stuck it out and he persisted and he dealt with the, you know, human trials and tribulations and cultivated his inner life uh, to respond to that. And I think that's a, 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 an important takeaway for all of us when, you know, stuff happens. <laughs> it happens to people like him too. Right. And he lived through some very challenging historical periods as well. He lived through Indian independence and the struggle for that. He lived through World War and he was teaching, the teachings that we read from him seem somewhat divorced from uh, anything located in time. But of course, he, he was very much of the world as well. That's right. That's right. Um, he, that, that, that was a really nice uh, thing to discover. Um, he, he was aware of world conditions. He was aware of what was going on in the world. And, you know, so, some of the paradoxes of trying, uh, living a spiritual life in the world, uh, you see played out in his life. So he would speak in the usual uh, Vedantic way of saying, you know, w the world of change and form and substance and relativity is all is Maya, and our attention should be on the eternal, infinite self, and and that's the the, the true reality, and all the rest of it is uh, just the, the sort of uh, play of consciousness. At the same time, and he used movies as an analogy, movies uh, being a fairly new technology at the time. Uh, I mean, think of it. He, he was here. When he arrived here, there were silent movies. Seven or eight years later, there were talking movies. That, that's the, where he was in, in, in technological uh, history. But, um, and he would talk about the images on the movie screen being like the play of uh, human events and worldly events, and that our attention should be on the light that shines on all of it. At the same time, he took it seriously. He did not just dismiss it and say, divorce yourself from worldly events. He was uh, busy himself. He worked very hard. He drove the people around him to work very hard. He taught householders to have their daily sadhana, do their practices faithfully every day, that, that's the, that was their highest priority, and, but then to do their duty as parents and uh, business people or whatever they were, uh, do it, and to do it well and to do it impeccably. And took world events seriously. He commented on them. He spoke out against injustices. He spoke out against about the greed and avarice that led to the depression. He spoke out about the uh, bad treatment of the poor and the needy. He spoke out uh, favor, in favor of Gandhi and the Indian independence movement and other worldly issues. And it's especially interesting to note that by doing so, he put himself at some risk mm -hmm. because until the last few years of his life, he was a British subject. He was traveling on a British passport as a citizen of the British Empire in India. the Brits were spying on him and other Indians. This is a time when in, people from India could not be citizens in America. Um, and they were keeping an eye on him as a, 
somebody who might be, you know, spearheading some favorable ideas about Gandhi, or maybe even uh, sending money from America to support the Indian independence movement. There were people suspected of sending weapons to the Indian independence movement, to the non-Gandhian branches of those movements. So they were keeping an eye on him and spying on him and opening his mail. Um, and he could have been deported at any time, you know, as an unwanted sort of um, uh, radical or something. But he, he did speak out, probably cautiously. Um, and I admired that. He cared about the state of the world and spoke out about things, um, even though he was uh, a spiritual teacher. He, he did not divorce himself from the world. What, what do you feel like the takeaway is for contemporary seekers from what you learned about his life? What, what about his life is applicable? Because he's so, he's, he looms as such a large figure and his discipline and his renunciation seems so far from most people's lives. How do you feel like the average contemporary dedicated seeker can benefit from reading your book, understanding his humanity, understanding the depth of his attainment, understanding the challenges and the controversy around him? What would be the takeaways? Well, I've already alluded to some of it. Uh, <clears throat> one was the, the importance of perseverance, uh, not just um, with respect to the challenges of life. You know, he was a man with a mission. He was a man who was obeying his dharma. And, and that's one of the takeaways. There was, you know, he, even though he was tempted to give it up and go live in a cave, even though, you know, he missed India that badly and Indian way of life, he knew he had this mission that was given him by his guru and his guru lineage, and he was going to take it seriously and he was going to fulfill it. And he worked very hard. But he also worked very hard at his own development. And that was always the priority. He taught the people around him, he taught his disciples that spiritual practice, that sadhana was the highest priority and not to compromise on that. And then to switch gears and not compromise uh, one's duties and responsibilities either, to, to live a balanced life in that regard and uh, not to sacrifice uh, the material world for your spiritual attainment, and certainly not to sacrifice your spiritual life uh, for material attainment. That always came first. And it was a very practical teaching. It was not just that the highest fulfillment comes from developing the inner spiritual life, but it's also uh, a, a framework and a foundation for a more successful life in the world that, you know, the, the sort of inner peace and clarity of consciousness you get from these methods uh, has a carryover effect. And you, so it, it was, a, you know, these are practical teachings. There's that, the importance of knowing and following one's own dharma and uh, the importance of, of regular sadhana and what I alluded to earlier, that um, not to have unrealistic expectations about life in the material world. You know, there's a passage in the Gita that always uh, appealed to me when I was uh, in the early stages of my seeking. And it's about the, how the, uh, the yogi, the, the developed person, uh, has equanimity and loss and gain and victory and defeat and pleasure and pain. Somehow, subconsciously, that translated to me that there won't be pain and there won't be loss and there won't be defeat. No, it doesn't say that. And Yogananda is a good example of that because he had loss, loved ones died. He, he had setbacks in his uh, mission 
He struggled with money. There were defeats. There were victories. There were many pleasures. There was pain. And um, he knew that that's the stuff of life. And the inner state, the development of the inner state that provides equanimity even in the midst of it and ability to respond uh, efficaciously to these things is the highest priority. And he, he modeled that really. And that's a good reminder. It's, a, yeah, you know, I've been on this path for more years than I care to admit. And, and yet I need those reminders myself. And I think we all do. So that that's kind of like, you know, we, we read the uh, great people and uh, extraordinary lives because, um, we get something from it, whether it's, you know, Lincoln or Einstein or, you know, Steve Jobs or whoever. Uh, so this is an example of a spiritual luminary, uh, but some of the same kind of lessons can be drawn. That's great. It's really true what you're saying that those, that he, his life unfolded with plenty of challenge and he also experienced inner challenge as well. Yeah. That he had, he had his deep realization. He had his ability to teach and transmit. He had his dedicated sadhana. And he had moments of, and more than moments of self-doubt and he questioning. Did. And in the midst of his own experience of, of spiritual power and transmission and, and uh, energy and illumination, he also wondered whether he was really in touch with it in the way he should be, whether he was really, had really attained it, whether he was really doing the right thing, whether he was really on the right path, whether he was really being of benefit. All, yep. of, all of those very human questions, because in the end, you know, as our lives unfold, we can't self-reflect. Like you said, you were not afforded that objectivity of time and distance on our own lives. And I found that also moving that his own humanity in no way diminishes his attainment or his accomplishments. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. And I think one of the things that made his life uh, interesting and uh, absorbing to uh, study and write about and that makes it an important life for all of us to know about is that um, unlike many gurus he was he was rather open uh, about his personal life and his feelings and his emotions uh, and uh, you know you don't get that from a, a lot of uh, spiritual teacher uh, uh, people, especially people with big followings, um, but he he had he was an emotional guy in many ways, and uh, you know he laughed big, and he enjoyed, and you know he also got angry, and he was upset with people, and um, and and showed that you know at least in in letters to to certain people, if not you know I. We won't know how open he was about those things, you know, when he was uh, in public. But um, I, I think the fact that um, we have somebody we can assume had was an exemplar of higher consciousness and realization, who at the same time was very human, who was a renunciate and a monk, but at the same time, you know, engaged with the world. The, the, there, there's a certain role model quality uh, to studying his life that I think we can all benefit from. Great. Thank you, Phil. So this is the book, The Life of Yogananda. I encourage everyone to pick up a copy. It is a great read and moving, inspiring, illuminating, and like you said, very human. Um, yeah. So thank you for doing all that work. It really is a gift and a companion to the far out stories in his autobiography, by no yeah. means covering the same territory. 
and I can't wait for what you're going to write next. Well, thank you, Amy. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for the kind words and uh, stay in touch. All right.